Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'm happy to be talking to you about learned behavior. Now, learned behavior is behavior that's modified based on your experiences. And so it's kind of interesting. It's, it's a bit of an advanced behavior. And it sort of is at the end of a continuum, beginning with innate behavior. Now, innate behavior is genetically programmed and instinctive. And so I wanted to start off with that just to sort of transition between innate behavior uh, and learned behavior. And so uh, a really cool example of innate behavior is something called fixed action pattern. And so do you see this snake right here? It's called a hognose snake. And when a predator is threatening it, it'll start to hiss. And then it'll do something kind of unusual. Let me check it out. And so in this case, the predator is, is a somewhat foolish person, although it's, not, <laughs> although it's not a poisonous snake. But certainly, if a predator is, is agitating it like that, okay, don't try this at home. Do you see how it's hissing and hissing? And then the sign stimulus, which is what it's responding to, is, is a sort of bit being messed with. And then its fixed action pattern is that it'll roll over on its back and look, it's, it's like playing dead. It's completely motionless and it won't respond. And so at this point, maybe it's relying on the fact that maybe the predator will go away. How about that? Isn't that kind of interesting? I find that kind of interesting. <laughs> and so I want to transition a little bit between innate behavior and learn behavior and sort of like the in between these two is this simple behavior called imprinting. Now imprinting sort of includes both um, components of innate behavior which is genetically programmed and learned behavior. And the thing about it is that it's limited to a sensitive period. So early in an organism's life there's a period where the young imprint, I'll use that as a verb, on their parent. So this was first sort of worked out by the, the famous biologist, the Austrian biologist, Conrad Lorenz. He's sometimes referred to as the mother, the mother goose because he was working with goose. And as it turns out, when you remove the mother or geese, when you remove the mother from the, from the children, they'll basically follow any person that sort of is like the parent. And so let me, let me show you this. Um, what I'm getting at here. And so here's a, uh, here's a video of, let me sort of fast forward this here to, this is Conrad Lorenz. Let me let this play out. And so Conrad, Conrad Lorenz is working with these, um, with the geese. And so when they're, when the new hatchlings are very young, they're basically going to follow the, the first thing that they see. And often the very first thing that you see is your mother. And so you want to be able to follow your mother, uh, evolutionarily speaking, because then you'll be safe. She'll protect you and help you get along. But in this case, check it out. The little ones are following like a person. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. And then like, hear the ducks swimming. <laughs> so they're basically following. And you might think, well, these ducks are not very bright. You know, they're following a guy in a rowboat. But the truth is, I think they are pretty intelligent because this is a survival behavior. And so um, what's really supposed to happen is this, like check this out, this is more natural here. So you see how the little guys are following the mother and so when a new hatchling is born, it's like, come on, and then jumps into the water and basically this is the imprinting. So when they're very young, during a sensitive period, they'll follow the first sort of moving object, if you will. And so this is, uh, what's known as imprinting. And so there's some really wacky stuff that you can find on uh, YouTube. And so I took the liberty of finding this little scene with a little tiny duck imprinting on a dog. Check it out. And so here's the little duck. And basically it thinks that the, the dog is its mother. It's kind of cute. <laughs> So it's hanging out with the with the dog, maybe pestering the dog. And so basically the duck will go wherever the dog will go, imprinting. 
doesn't seem like the dog minds too much. And so, all right, so let's just jump right into this conversation here about learning. And so imprinting, again, it has to occur during the sensitive period. And so uh, it's, it's recognition response. So you're trying to recognize like a parent and it's an attachment of a young to the to an adult or really any any sort of object. And so here's a picture, famous photograph of of uh, Conrad Lorenz, and he was like the mother. He was the mother goose. And so the, the geese followed him uh, and they imprinted on him. And so he isolated them uh, from their mother and so they could no longer uh, imprint on the mother, so they imprinted on him instead. And so he showed that when baby geese spent the first few hours with him, they imprinted in, uh, with him instead of the parent. And there's other uh, examples of this, like cranes following, like flying contraptions like this. And so another example of imprinting I find kind of interesting is that these juvenile salmon will imprint on sort of chemical messages, so we believe, in, in streams. And so when they go out to the ocean and they come back, they're able to um, detect the very stream that they were born in. And so as, here's the adult when they come to spawn. So I find that to, that's kind of interesting. So here's the connection between like innate behavior and learning. So learning is really, really important uh, behavior in animal uh, biology because innate behavior is fixed. And so you're, it's, it's either going to work for you or not. But learning is modification. So you could learn something, and we all are familiar with this, you can learn something that's not good and then sort of adjust your behavior and sort of avoid that um, the second time around. And so it's really crucial. And so I want to differentiate between what we mean by when some people say, you know, the bird's learning to fly or the baby's learning to walk. Not exactly, because learning to fly has more to do with something called maturation. In other words, there's a neuromuscular development that occurs just over a period of time, which enables a bird to be able to fly. It's not that it's actually learning. It's not true learning. Now, when you look at learning, it's always interesting to sort of break up the different kinds of learning. And so there's one kind of learning called associative learning. So this is what it sounds like. You're associating one thing with another. And so associative learning is when, like for example, I'll give you an example. So here's this little white-footed mouse and it's learning to avoid caterpillars that sort of have an interesting striped pattern to them because it sort of learned through association, but when it eats that, it's very distasteful and it's like, hmm, it happens to be the, the caterpillar of the monarch butterfly. That, that, that's eating a lot of milkweed, and so it takes on a an unpalatable sort of bitter taste. And so the mouse avoids eating that because it's learned to associate that pattern with the distasteful uh, experience. And so one of the classic biologists that, or sociologists, if you want to look at it that way, or psychologists, is, is uh, Pavlov, a Russian a psychologist, we'll just call him that. He worked with classical conditioning, and in classical conditioning, you might be familiar with this experiment, he was working with dogs. And they're sometimes known as Pavlov's dogs. And so what he was doing was, he, he was feeding these dogs, and basically he was either feeding them meat or he was giving them powdered meat. And every time he did that, he was, uh, the dog salivated in response to eating meat because they need saliva to start their digestion of the meat. And as it turns out, he decided to ring a bell, something that really is has nothing to do, kind of random, has nothing to do with digestion uh, or meat or dogs. And so every time he introduced the powdered meat, the dogs associated the bell ringing with the fact that the meat was coming. or the, And so... After a while, they started to associate that, this, and then they learned that the bell meant that the, the meat was coming. So, so you know where this is going. So there was a time where he removes the, the meat entirely, and he sets the dogs into the cage, and he starts 
ring the bell and lo and behold there's no meat at all and the dogs start to salivate because they've been classically conditioned to associate the bell with the presence of meat kind of interesting now along those lines there's another type of associative learning called operant conditioning this one's really important operant conditioning is sometimes known as trial and error learning so the animal learns to associate one of its own behaviors with a reward or a punishment. You, you can see this fellow right here got a lot of thorns in its face because probably it, it was messing with a porcupine. And so as a result of that association, it'll now learn that that was a punishment, sort of <laughs> uh, messing with the porcupine. And so therefore it'll avoid the porcupine in the, in the future. And so again, it's the the psychologist that's often associated, kind of pun intended, with uh, operant conditioning is uh, B.F. Skinner. And so he did a lot of experiments with trial and error in terms of he put, uh, he created these interesting apparatus, these boxes, and he put pigeons in them and different animals with different levers, and they would learn to manipulate them, and he would give them rewards or punishment, and he would be able to train them, if you will. To, uh, to do what he wanted them to do. And so trial and error is really, really important. We, I mean, we respond to this as well, but it's basically that avoidance behavior that I was mentioning with the mouse. Here's that caterpillar that I was talking about from the monarch butterfly. I mean, you have to be able to associate this pattern to distaste to avoid it, or you have to be able to associate this pattern of a snake if, if warning coloration is to work. And so animals can avoid electric fences because they they learn to associate that they can they can avoid poisonous organisms or traps through trial and error and what's interesting is i've been sort of emphasizing the negative in other words it like they don't do that don't you know in other words like when you test if you touch fire you'll learn that it's hot but really the opposite the reward mechanism is really really powerful and i think we all respond to this there's a lot of studies, especially recent studies, about how the brain really, really positively responds to doing the right thing. I mean, we get praise from our parents and from our friends, and we get rewards. And even when we do something great, even it's the, the research shows that the brain releases chemicals called dopamines that respond to the learning. And so when we do something good and we make a right choice, the, the brain feels good about it and so it, that's a reward and so it encourages us to to want to do it more uh it's sort of like getting a, a a star and it also here's the thing that's really cool it actually helps the brain to learn the more reward that you get how about that that's something to consider so when you get stars on your paper or you get compliments from your teacher uh, all these things are really important it helps to motivate you to continue your great efforts and so Another interesting thing about learning is that if we're responding to some sort of stimuli and it turns out that it's an unimportant stimulus, then we'll have to avoid responding to it. Like, for example, some of you may be familiar with the fact that sometimes if you're a student at school, the fire alarm seems to go off a little often. <laughs> we'll just say that. Yeah, although it's, you know, of course, there to protect everyone's safety. But if it goes off often, 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 eventually you, you lose your responsiveness to an unimportant stimulus. And so this is called habituation. You become habituate, habituated to the signal. In other words, like here's this prairie dog. And as it turns out, when, when somebody goes by, it starts screaming like wild and then it'll jump back into its burrow. And so that's sort of an alarm call. But as it turns out, if a person keeps walking by, like there's prairie dogs at the at the zoo, if you keep walking by the, the prairie dog, eventually it's going to be like, okay, this person's not going to hurt me. I'm not going to scream anymore. And so it becomes, it's, it's an example of habituation. And it's like the famous cry wolf effect. So in other words, you know, the wolf is coming, the wolf is coming. And then the, the farmer comes running out and the little boy's like, ah, psych, just kidding. And then, uh, and then the, the wolf is coming, the wolf is coming, and the farmer runs out there and there's no wolf. And then eventually 
when something happens and then the farmer doesn't come. And so, <laughs> so another type of learning is called uh, spatial learning. And so this is something that's a little complex. And so this is something where we're using our observational skills, okay? Spatial learning. And so another uh, biologist came along called Nico uh, Tinbergen. Um, and he was working with wasps and he was trying to figure out how that they were able to learn where their nests were. And so check this out. And so he was running some different experiments. And so, you know, the, the wasp nest is actually kind of a small hole and it's like, how in the world can the, the wasp go out and then come back a couple of hours later and find its nest? It's incredible. Does it remember or does it use some sort of like objects around spatial objects uh, to help remember where it's going. And so in this case, it, the thought is maybe it's using uh, pine cones as a, as a sort of a marker of where to go. And so if you move the pine cones, then the wasp is not able to find the nest. And so as it turns out, you can keep playing with this. You could sort of uh, replace the pine cones with rocks, and that works as well. Or how about this? Maybe it's not even the pine cones or the rocks, but it's actually the circle that it's actually using to, uh, to base its observation on. So you can try different patterns like triangles and what have you. And so a, in a, a most fascinating example of spatial learning is an octopus. The octopus is capable of learning by watching, okay? I, I know that that may sound a little hard to believe, but I got to show you something here about the octopus. And so let's come over here if I can. This is an experiment. Um, where are we here? This is an experiment about an octopus in, in an aquarium. And it's, uh, it's, it's being faced with a challenge. In other words, a prey is being put inside the, the uh, aquarium inside of a little plastic container. And it's rather difficult to to open it up and the octopus is pretty smart. And as it turns out, they place another octopus in a, a tank next to it so that it can watch. And so check this out. In the other side of the tank, the same kind of box is given to an octopus that has spent a few days in the lab and has learned how to get into the multiple opening box. This octopus is called the trainee. It immediately starts to open the box to get at the prey. To me, that's remarkable. I mean, that's just, that's kind of wild that it's able to watch uh, and therefore learn what to do. And, and not only to, again, like he said, mimic, but he's able to understand the situation. And so what we're talking about here is, you know, again, the youth learning from the, the older, wiser, like parent. There could be a, like an older brother or an aunt or uncle or grandparent, but animals learn to solve problems um, by observing other individuals. And again, you know, this is something that we could really uh, resonate with. So chimpanzees are capable of doing this. And so they learn to crack nuts with stones by watching other older chimpanzees. And so not only are they able to do use rocks to crack open uh, nuts and things, but they're even able to modify and tools. They're able to make judgments about what 
twig works best and how they can, if they remove the leaves and how, if they lick it, it'll become like a little bit more sticky. And then you can stick it inside the ant hole and get more ants this way. And so they're able, chimps using tools, really remarkable um, types of behavior. Like for example, again, over here, I happen to have it. Um, I don't know, I just can't get enough of watching this. It's just remarkable how, look at this chimpanzee. <laughs> it's like it's working in the kitchen preparing dinner. So it's it's modifying its tools, it's making judgments, it's learning what works um, better, what doesn't work. So it's 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 true definition of learning. So it's it's based on its experience, it's modifying its behavior. One of the you know, it's not just chimpanzees, it's like crows are able to solve complex problems. They're very intelligent. And so we're getting into an area called cognition. In other words, like the process of knowing. To be cognitive, cognitive means to be aware, to use reasoning skills, and to solve problems and sort of use recollection or memory based on something that you've tried earlier and then weigh it in terms of judgment of what works better. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. And so like, let me, let me test out your cognition here. So this is known as the candle problem. Do you see this? There's a candle here. If I asked you to stick that candle on the wall and light it, how would you do that? Okay. How would you stick the candle onto the wall and light it? That's, you can pause the video if you want to, and if, if you need a little bit more time. <laughs> okay. So spoiler alert, here we go. So check this out. You know, most people try to think that they can like melt the, the candle and stick it on the wall, that won't work, or take the thumbtacks and put it on the wall and fix it that way. But in fact, it, it throws people because the box itself that was holding the, uh, the thumbtacks doesn't have to be holding the thumbtacks. You can dump those out and then fix that to the wall, put the candle here and then light it. So this is uh, using cognition and problem solving skills. And so chimpanzees are aware of this. You can put chimpanzees into a, into a room and fix like a banana, something they really love on the top and they can't reach it. And all, all that you have to do is put boxes in the room. And what they'll do is they'll sort of use their reasoning power and <laughs> stack them up and then climb up to the top in order to reach it. It's incredible. So they, they're problem solving and they're devising strategies to overcome an obstacle. And so this is a use of insight. This is insight that they're employing in order to solve this problem. It's incredible. And so, so in the end, you know, we talk about learning as being experiential and what, what better way to experience things by practicing. And so this brings up the whole notion of play as, as being the ultimate basis for practice, because, you know, playing with your siblings or, uh, playing with dolls or, or playing soccer, playing sports, all of this play in our life. We put so much attention into it. And basically, we're developing experiences and we're modifying our behavior so that really when the real thing comes, we'll be more prepared. There's a lot of investment in play to practice because you can hurt yourself. Uh, while, while you're playing, there's a lot of energy being put into play, but it's, it's just that valuable. That's what we're talking about. So play not only like prepares us experientially, and it helps us to learn about life, but it also helps us to develop socially as well. In other words, like um, interact with our peers and our cohorts. And so that's going to be the next discussion that we have is, is uh, social kinds of behaviors, which are really, really interesting. And so finally, I'm going to leave you with this. You know, this consciousness is, is a, a curious thing. It's really difficult to know when you're studying animals. It's a real challenge. Is the animal really aware of what they're doing? Are they really making a decision? Uh, it's hard to know, but let me leave you with this example. You know, here's a, a female kill deer. It's a bird. And what's interesting about this is that if a predator is coming, now of course it's 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 it needs to protect the nest and its and its little ones, but 
in the event of a predator coming, it will actually move away from the nest of little ones because they're in danger. And it'll actually flop around and pretend that it's hurt as a decoy to draw the predator away. And at the last second, since it's not really hurt, it'll fly away and it'll avoid it just to distract the predator away from the young. It's a remarkable behavior. Is it aware of what it's doing? Is it using judgment and reason to do to do that behavior? It's, it's very difficult to know, but it's fascinating. So I hope you enjoyed this video on learning. Thanks for watching.